uh, when you have a breakdown of the joint, <clears throat> you can wear away those structures, eventually exposing the underlying components such as the blood vessels and nerves. So before we get to the damage of the soft cartilage and the hard tissue and the bone, uh, we wanna look at this fluid filled capsule called the synovium. And inside the synovial membrane, there are these little glands that produce the synovial fluid. And inside the synovial fluid is an ingredient called hyaluronic acid. And hyaluronic acid is very special uh, fluid. It's actually a non-Newtonian fluid, meaning it doesn't follow the laws of physics. Uh, typically, if you take a boat and you put it in water, it displaces the water and it floats. If you were to take that same body of water and drain it and fill it with hyaluronic acid and try to launch the boat, the boat would tip over because as you compress hyaluronic acid, it becomes more dense and it resists that compression. So it's a very special type of fluid that are inside our joints. It's not just like water uh, or a normal fluid. And this is what allows the bones to glide next to each other and not come into contact and keeps everything nice and healthy and strengthens the cartilage uh, and so forth. This hyaluronic acid uh, not only cushions and lubricates the joint and acts as a shock absorber, but it also nourishes the cartilage. It keeps the cartilage um, very elastic and able to rebound and able to suffer small traumas and recover from them. But over time, as the synovial fluid goes from a thick consistency to a thinner consistency, it allows the bones to move closer together. And as that happens, it creates friction. And the friction will wear away the soft cartilage, uh, the meniscus, eventually the hard cartilage, the hyaline cartilage, and then beyond that, the bones themselves. Um, so if you've been told you have a bone spur or an osteophyte, that's a sign that you've worn through some of that protective hard cartilage and the bone is now trying to regrow and thicken to uh, deal with that extra pressure and impact that it is suffering from. If you've ever bent your knee while going up and down stairs, getting in and out of a car, uh, et cetera, and it's felt like it's caught or latched and then releases, you're probably feeling little pieces of the loose cartilage or bone uh, getting stuck and then grinding past them as you go through your range of motion. So those are some telltale signs that you might be suffering from more advanced osteoarthritis. Now, if you're feeling any type of electrical pain that might shoot down your calf into your foot or up your thigh into your buttocks or low back, that's most likely because you've worn through your hyaline cartilage and exposed the underlying nerve endings that wrap the bone. It's not much different than if you've ever chipped your tooth and had that very sharp pain from the nerve being exposed. So if you've got that type of electrical pain, you've probably worn through your uh, hyaline articular cartilage. So before we get into some of the treatments for osteoarthritis that you may have tried and failed and how the advanced arthritis relief protocol is a unique non-surgical alternative, I'd like to look at some x-rays from actual patients. These x-rays were provided to us from uh, two of the centers that we certified here in Orlando, Florida. And before we get into the osteoarthritic x-rays, I'd like to show you a normal x-ray because it's hard to tell what's wrong if you don't know what's right. I remember when I got my MRI years ago, um, they put it up on the screen and told me why I was so bad and why I had to have surgery, but they never really explained specifically what was wrong or what it should have looked like and why it didn't look that way. So we're looking at two x-ray views here. One is called the AP or anterior to posterior front to back view. And the other is a lateral side view. Let's start with the front to back. This guitar pick shaped structure here, that's your patella or your kneecap. And you can see it between the two femoral condyles, just like in the drawing we saw a few slides ago. You can see the thick hyaline articular cartilage covering the bone there. These soft rounded mounds here in the middle are called your tibial spines. All this black that you see in between the joint, x-ray shows hard tissue. And the more bright and white something is, the more dense that tissue is. All the black that you see is not empty space. That's where your meniscus is. It's where your synovial fluid is holding that space open. And then lastly, if we kind of trace the outlines of the bones, we can see that they follow the same pattern uh, and are in proper alignment. Now, if we look at the lateral x-ray, we're trying to see, does this patella, does this kneecap have space between itself and between the femur bone here, which it does. So this is a normal knee x-ray. Now let's look at abnormal. In early osteoarthritis, also called Kellgren-Lawrence grade one uh, osteoarthritis, 
you can begin to see a little loss of joint space. And if you look at that kneecap, it's slightly out of alignment, still in that channel, but a little more outside than it should be. Uh, because as you suffer from osteoarthritis, most people uh, have uh, this deformity where the femur bone starts to move inward. You would think your tibia, your shin bone would be what moves out of alignment, uh, but actually it's the large bone, the femur, that typically moves out of alignment uh, in the joint. So we can see that moving inward, compressing that space, and the kneecap being slightly out of alignment as a result. In grade one osteoarthritis, you're probably not feeling any pain or suffering from any symptoms. It's the early portion. Around grade two is typically when people start to feel pain, soreness, stiffness, swelling, um, and other uncomfortable symptoms, not necessarily debilitating symptoms. And at this portion of the disease, there's a little more loss of joint space. You can sometimes see tiny osteophytes or bone spurs beginning to form. You can see those tibial spines that used to be smooth and round like the Appalachian Mountains are now sharp and pointy like the Rockies, and they're wearing away. Kneecap still in pretty good alignment here. Um, and this is where you'll get intermittent pain. Now, if you have pain all the time, you've probably progressed to Kelgren Lawrence grade three. So this is where the knee's further out of alignment. You can see the kneecap over here. With this much of a misalignment, um, you'll probably hear clicking, cracking, popping, uh, all types of different noises coming from your knee when you bend it and do certain activities. And what you're listening to is your kneecap actually grinding over your femur bone. Uh, and that impact taking place. You can see the osteophytes a little larger here, a little easier to see. Those tibial spines have been worn away and there's a lot less joint space available. At this stage, you might even have to use a cane or ice your knee regularly. Uh, it might keep you even from doing certain activities like golfing, dancing, or, or more strenuous uh, type motions. At Kelgren Lawrence grade four, which is the most severe stage of osteoarthritis, uh, you've progressed to a point where you may be bone on bone. You've got large osteophytes. You've worn through the cartilage, kneecaps even further out of alignment. Typically people <clears throat> that are at this stage of the disease are using a walker or a wheelchair uh, or can't even walk at all uh, and are wheelchair stricken. So if you're not using a walker or a wheelchair and you can still move around, you're probably grade three or lower. But I'm gonna show you an x-ray today from a patient who was in a wheelchair, unable to walk, very badly bone on bone, Kelgren Lawrence grade four, and we were able to help her return uh, to normal function and uh, walking under her own power and many other great improvements. I will show you that pre and post x-ray before we are done here today. So even if you are in a wheelchair or a walker, don't despair, this treatment may still work for you, even if other treatments have failed in the past. Now, before we move on, I wanna show you what a partial knee replacement looks like for a few reasons. If it turns out that you come in for your risk-free consultation and you really are that badly progressed with the disease that injections and alternative treatments will not work for you and you have to receive a surgical consultation, remember a partial knee replacement. They only compromise about 5% of the knee replacements performed annually in our country. I make the argument it's not because they're less effective, but because they're less costly, uh, that they are underutilized. But a partial knee replacement makes a lot of sense. It replaces only the half of the knee joint that has gone bad. And if you go back to these x-rays we were looking at, one side was always much more worse than the other, right? So if both sides haven't gone bad, why replace them both? Let's just replace the bad half. And the beauty of a partial knee replacement, even if you've had one before and you still have pain, is it leaves the synovial capsule intact. That fluid-filled structure is stitched back up and remains in your body after a partial. So if you've had a partial and your pain returns or it didn't work all the way, you can still have injections and treatments like our advanced arthritis relief protocol, and you don't have to go back under the knife a second time. I'll show you a little later a total knee replacement and in those they, they remove that capsule completely so you run out of non-surgical alternatives. So that's what a partial knee replacement looks like. So where does Sound Integrated Medical Center and Dr. Phoebe and his team come in? So the advanced arthritis relief protocol is meant for when other conservative care has failed. You've been taking ibuprofen every day, Advil. You've tried hot and cold. You've tried to lose weight. You've tried exercise or rehab. Maybe you've even had cortisone injections and those haven't worked for you. Well, the specialized unloading bracing exercise protocol 
and joint fluid therapy that will replenish that synovial fluid and help to give you an opportunity to regenerate cartilage and normal tissue uh, is a great next step prior to undergoing surgery. Uh, and you can know that you've exhausted all your options if you do have to go under the knife after going through a protocol like this. In fact, many insurances such as Medicare are now requiring patients to try and fail intraarticular injections, bracing, and therapy before they'll cover the surgery, whereas prior to May of 2017, that wasn't a requirement. The surgeon could go right to that more invasive approach without trying these other less invasive, less risky, and less costly alternatives first. Uh, now, we combine these treatments into a uniform protocol where they're done at the same time. You get the injection on the same day the brace is applied to increase the joint space and allow that injection to be more effective, and exercises are given for you to do at home. Therapy might be applied in the clinic. We might follow these injections up with regenerative medicine techniques like platelet-rich plasma to help you grow your cartilage back faster. Now, the reason I'm making such a point on this is usually in healthcare, you try and fail a single treatment, then move on to another. Oh, therapy didn't work, let's try cortisone. Oh, cortisone didn't work, let's try bracing. Well, we had the bright idea that if these things individually are somewhat effective, couldn't they be more effective if we did them all at the same time? So that was what the advanced arthritis relief protocol really began as, and it turned out to be much more effective than doing these treatments separately. So let's look at some of the things you may have tried and failed in the past, like pain medications, Vicodin, hydrocodone, tramadol. Uh, these medications are uh, opioids or other um, derivatives that are designed to slow down the rate at which your nerves transmit information. It's not fixing what's causing the pain, but it's making it more difficult for you to sense that pain. So it's covering up the problem, not necessarily fixing it. And the problem with pain medications is uh, they tend to be very risky, not only in their habit-forming nature. Most people in our country that are addicted to some type of, a, of an illegal opiate started out on a legal one where they got a prescription as a result of an injury or a surgery. Uh, and, you know, these are very, very strong medications. Uh, they can create a physical dependence of your body. Uh, but they can also cause some pretty serious side effects because they don't just slow down your nerves. They slow down all functions in the body. That's why the bottle says may cause constipation for two weeks or longer. It slows down your GI system. It makes it more difficult to breathe. And you might feel foggy uh, or less sharp mentally because it's slowing down the, the axons and the neurons in the brain as well, not just the nerves uh, that are uh, transmitting pain signal. They're slowing down the regular nerves too. So for all those reasons, pain medications, especially used over an extended period of time, are quite risky. Now, what about the over-the-counter stuff that doesn't require prescription? Tylenol, acetaminophen, Advil, ibuprofen, or Aleve, so do you have naproxen? Well, this family of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, they're relatively safe. I mean, they have baby Tylenol. You can give this to infants under certain scenarios. And the thing with these medications is they're very safe in smaller doses and shorter periods of time. But if you're taking six to eight ibuprofen a day, like I was for months and months and months, maybe even years, that's when you can start having the liver damage, the kidney damage, the serious side effects. And I learned about the risk of long-term use of NSAIDs when uh, my daughter was a baby. She had her first fever and her first real sickness. And being new parents, my wife and I rushed her to the emergency room and you know, thought it was the end of the world, didn't know what to do. Uh, and they go, give her Tylenol and give her Motrin every four hours, switch between the two. And I said, okay. So I go to the pharmacy, buy these medications, and I decide I really want to get this right. I'm going to read all the instructions. So I peel the label back, I, I read all the instructions, and something really interesting was in those instructions that said, should not be used for more than seven consecutive days. And I thought, holy cow, I was using ibuprofen for months. I didn't know that it became dangerous after seven consecutive days. So when you look at the 30,000 plus people every year that die in the United States from Tylenol, it's not because Tylenol is inherently risky, it's because they were using a lot of it over an extended period of time not the way you're supposed to use the medication based on the label and guidelines and instructions. So that's where those become risky. So if you don't want to use these oral medications, uh, looks like surgery is your only option, right? Not anymore. There are many other things that can be tried before surgery. And when you get to surgery, it's not always a guarantee it will work. These knee replacements are not made specifically to fit you. They come in standardized sizes. In the total knee replacement I'm gonna show you the x-ray of, you can see the bone hanging over the edge of where the hardware was installed. 
they also tend not to last for an extended period of time. 